Good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, where we're looking at the implications of restrictions to online freedom of expression in Asia. Uh, my name is Champ Patel, and I'm the director of the Asia Pacific program at Chatham House. And what we want to do today is have a discussion. So please do feel free to contribute your thoughts and questions. You'll see the Q&A function on your screens at the bottom um, about this particular issue. Now, what we've seen in recent years is that state-led clampdowns on online freedom of expression have really become widespread across Asia, and this has certainly accelerated and intensified with the COVID-19 crisis. Now, the reasons for this are complex and diverse, strain on history, culture, and politics, in addition to external influences. But what we are seeing across the region is that governments are accused of silencing online criticism and failing to uphold the rights to free speech. In China, which will be one of the focuses that we have today, uh, what we've seen is the government's restrictive online regime has relied on a combination of legal, technical, and other tactics to manage control of the internet. So our panelists today are going to discuss the latest regional developments um, affecting online freedom of expression and consider the broader regional and international implications for technology governance. Now with us to discuss these issues, is Yatra Wang, who's China researcher at Human Rights Watch. Uh, she works on issues including internet censorship, freedom of expression, protection of civil society, human rights defenders, and women's rights. Prior to joining Human Rights Watch, Wang worked for the Committee to Protect Journalists. And also joining us is my dear colleague, Harriet Moynihan. She's the Senior Research Fellow in the International Law Program, where she leads the program CyberWig. Now, this work focuses both on the role and value of international human rights law in internet governance, including in addressing uh, online content moderation and disinformation and the rule and application of international law. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Yatra, who will kick us off. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to use uh, several minutes to talk about the situation in China. Uh, you know, when the pandemic started in March, I attended uh, a panel talk and ex experts from different countries talked about the emergency laws and regulations countries uh, promulgated to control the, uh, the, uh, in, uh, the, the, the internet of uh, freedom of expression. Uh, I remembered that, you know, I made a point clear at that time that there was no emergency laws and regulations uh, by the Chinese government uh, even China was the first country that uh, had this uh, uh, pandemic um, and this emergency situation. Why? It's because the, uh, the internet is very much out of control by the Chinese government. There's no need of you know, more laws and regulations just to respond to our emergency situation. Um, earlier in, you know, in February and March, there was a period of a uh, brief period of outpouring of outrage on the Chinese internet. People were demanding free of freedom of speech because the Chinese government initially covered up the uh, the, the, the COVID nineteen and downplayed the uh, infections, and people were very very angry. Um, so there were, uh, you know, all the a lot of posts on the Chinese internet and also the Chinese media uh, were able to do very good reporting on uh, the situation in Wuhan. But I believe that it was more due, not due to the government's inability to control the internet, uh, but was because the government, the central government wanted to see, engage people's uh, emotion, like people's public opinion. At that time, I don't think the, the central government, Beijing, was trusting what the local government was was uh, saying or reporting to Beijing. So by letting people have some space to talk, the central government can see what's going on, rather than you know get all the information from the local Wuhan government. Uh, then after that period of outpouring of outrage. Uh, the situation very much was tamed um, through various mechanisms by the government. Uh, I think I always say that the most effective way of silencing uh, people's freedom of speech is physical detention. And this was, you know, again, deployed by the government to do uh, to uh, tame public opinion. 
uh, several journalists who citizen journalists uh, who went to Wuhan to report the situation were detained. Uh, they including uh, Chen Qiu Shi, who was used to be a lawyer. He went to Wuhan, and then he just used you know his phone and did some recording. Fang Bing, which was a local Wuhan businessman, he also uploaded some videos to YouTube and. Zhang Zhan, who, who also went to Wuhan. Uh, so Zhang Zhan, who, you know, basically went to Wuhan, did some video and posted on YouTube. When those videos were not even like widely viewed at all, first of all, uh, video, uh, you know, YouTube was banned in China. Um, then she later in December, she received four years of um, jail time for, you know, her for being going to Wuhan and do those videos that very few people watched anyway. Uh, and then there are also numerous, numerous detentions of people who are not activists, who are not, you know, journalists, assistant journalists, journalists for rumor mongering. And I think among those people, there are um, uh, people who are, you know, who posted the false information, something like, uh, you know, uh, I've heard uh, there were cases in my neighborhood of everybody, you know, be careful. Then the police detain those people and you know put them in detention center for like ten days or fifteen days. Uh, then there are also people who basically criticize the government for whatever reasons, um, and those people were detained. So that a number of people we don't know how many. Uh, China Human Rights Defender, an organization, they tallied what were public available. Uh, there were I think more than eight hundred cases that were just you know do in the early time of the pandemic. I believe the real number is much, much higher. Um, and that is, you know, the physical component. Then there's the online censorship. Um, as we all know, major platforms are banned, uh, international platforms are banned in China, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all that stuff. And it, it's not only that, you know, those platforms are banned because people still, some people are very, small portion of people who just can't stand the censorship. They use VPN to log on to Twitter, to YouTube, to express their opinions. So the audience has become smaller and smaller because, you know, the VPN, it's harder to use the VPN. There are punishments for you to sell VPN, to use VPN. However, even given that kind of context, the Chinese government still goes on to Twitter to silence Chinese users who are criticizing the government. So that is also happened during the COVID contest. There are um, people who were detained and uh, who were formally prosecuted and sentenced for their criticism of the Chinese government's COVID measurement and other issues uh, on Twitter. Um, you know, it's really, it just shows that the government just cannot tolerate any kind of criticism. Uh, even your audience is very small. Even, uh, you know, it's very hard for your message to spread. Uh, I mean, as we also know that um, within the Chinese internet, um, within the Chinese social media realm, um, you know, there were a lot of censorship. Uh, sensitive, sensitive words cannot be posted uh, or if you were able to post th those comments and they could be quickly taken down and, uh, you know, they were banned from sharing, uh, from commenting, uh, those we all know. Um, I think one thing that people, uh, some kind, uh, you know, sometimes overlook is the uh, algorithm. Um, um, you know, uh, for example, ByteDance, which owns TikTok, which you know is very popular outside of China, they have a app called Jinru Total, which is a news app. So I observed that during the COVID time, it, it's a news app. So uh, basically, you have the app and it uh, it, um, it feeds you what you want to read in terms of news. During the COVID contest, the you can clearly see that the Chinese government's propaganda was very much at the top of what you will receive, regardless of your preference. So these are the things that they do to make sure that you receive the information from the government uh, more. Then besides all this censorship going on, right? Then there's also the propaganda side. Uh, the propaganda and censorship work in tandem. Uh, it's it, it, it basically, it's, 
I think there's one side of the story, which is the uh, propaganda from the official channels, the government, state media, government controlled the newspaper, all that stuff. Then there's also the Umao, uh, the paid commentaries, the commentary and posts that were uh, not from the official channels. They were, uh, uh, you know, pretended to be regular citizens, regu uh, uh, you know, independent sources, but they are ultimately controlled by the government. So those are not only just on Chinese social media. The government pay had all their bots and uh, uh, on, on, on international social media like Twitter and Facebook. So they not only just want to control the narrative within the Chinese social media, within the Chinese internet, but they also wanted to influence the, the narratives on the international social media. Um, the propaganda and, and you know, disinformation is effective General, for two big reasons. One is I think people were generally happy with the Chinese government's COVID measures. I have friends and families who don't live in those areas that were under a tight lockdown. You know, when I spoke to them, they were you know, pretty satisfied, especially when they know what's going on with my situation in the United States. So secondly, I think given the, the contrast of what, how the U.S. government has terribly managed uh, the 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 pandemic. They made me people believe, you know, the control by the Chinese government in terms of the lockdown, in terms of the internet, was necessary. So, given this background, people are, you know, the propaganda were uh, were pretty successful. Um, and I think, besides the censorship and propaganda which I think were generally quite successful, you have to understood the success in the context of how technologies function in China, which is that it actually works pretty well as long as you don't talk about the, this political censorship stuff. So, uh, you know, WeChat uh, is a super app and you can use it to, to do all kinds of stuff uh, besides just to post on it uh, do social media stuff, messaging stuff. It's an app that you can use to get a taxi, pay your bills and all that stuff. So the efficiency of the technology uh, in China made people feel, you know, satis feel they're satisfied. Uh, even their censorship, I don't like it, but well, I just have to live with it. It's China, uh, you know, things work well. Otherwise, um, um, so, I think you know get the, the bigger contest is that the internet censorship has worked so well that you know the, the Chinese population are siding with the government's various human rights abuses. Uh, one thing that I think a lot of young people do believe that the Great Firewall, the censorship, is necessary because they feel you know it provides stability, uh, it filters better information from being viewed, especially if you see you know, the disinformation uh, happening in the United States, all this chaos, people feel, you know, young people feel probably it's, it's, it's not a bad thing, especially young people, they didn't grow up experience um, a, a functioning, a, a free internet. You know, I'm in my thirties. So when I was in college, the Chinese internet was free. Uh, pre, uh, there were censorship, but it was, pretty you know, free. So I had gone through the experience of having some freedom, then those freedom were taken away. I witnessed the Facebook being shut down, Twitter being shut down. But to the young people, they have never experienced Facebook. They didn't, some people didn't even know that, you know, Facebook uh, exists. So they pretty much are, you know, born into this internet. They, it's, it, it works and so, uh, you know, they didn't feel the kind of constraint I felt. Um, I mean, today, you know, there were an outpouring of the, on the internet against a lot of uh, European and American brands for them publicly, publicly announcing that they would not use Xinjiang cotton because of the abuses going on in Xinjiang. And there was such an outrage on the Chinese internet, uh, um, you know, against those brands because, you know, they were against the Chinese governments. Um, 
policies on Xinjiang. You can see, I mean, who would, agree, you know, if you get all the information you get, you wouldn't, uh, you know, side with the government's abuses in Xinjiang. It's horrific. But you can just see how the success, success for the Chinese government has been able to control the narrative, control the internet, so that people actually side with the government on the Xinjiang uh, uh, atrocities. Oh, so perhaps if we leave it there and then I can bring Harriet in, because I think this is an area that we're going to see a lot of, and many questions are coming through already, but maybe if we can come back to you on that, because I think, you know, what Yatro has done is really bring to life some of the dynamics that we're seeing occurring within China. But a lot of these uh, trends are also evident across the broader region, right, Harriet? So it'd be interesting to hear from you, for example, online censorship, use of technology for surveillance purposes that go beyond the necessary and the proportionate is something that we're seeing in other countries across the region as well. So what do you see as some of the regional or more international implications? Thank you, Champa. Um, well, I'd like to broaden the lens of it, as you say, and look at this trend for digital authoritarianism, which we, we've started to see in many countries around the world, but I think Asia is an area where we're particularly seeing it. Um, in the last few years, there have been a number of countries that have come out with laws that have restricted freedom of expression. And, and uh, rather like um, China, it's not just laws, it's a system where there is also state propaganda, there's also state surveillance, there's sometimes internet shutdowns and Asia is the place where we're seeing the most internet shutdowns in the world. So we've got this sort of general trend for digital authoritarianism and, and I'd like to sort of unpack to what extent is China an influence in that beyond its own borders. Um, and to what extent are there other factors in play as well? Um, Yachu has mentioned this sort of cyber sovereignty model, essentially, which we're seeing from China, which is really about state control of the internet, not just online content, but also keeping data within borders or controlling the flow of data across borders, and essentially forming a national internet where through the Great Firewall, there is control within a, region, within a country of its own internet. Um, and that's a very different model to one espoused by Western democracies, um, which tends to, they favor an open, uh, interconnected global internet, um, which is an internet in which uh, human rights are online as well as offline. So users can generally express themselves freely. They can access information relatively freely. Their freedom of assembly and association are also very possible. So we've got these increasingly divergent models um, and I suppose uh, what I'd like to look at is identify the three factors uh, that we bring out in our paper, which, which is a way in which Chinese uh, influence is, is starting to spread around the world in relation to this cyber sovereignty model. And the first factor I wanted to mention was um, international fora and um, Chinese increasing influence and positioning in those fora, particularly uh, on technical standards. Um, there are a number of uh, international bodies on technical standards of which the the International Telecommunications Union is one, it's probably the most uh, prominent. Um, and China's been very active there, putting forward new proposals, uh, essentially to sort of reconfigure the architecture of the internet to make it more state controlled and top down um, and less like the internet that we know at the moment, which is more connected and, and user based. Um, and beyond the technical community, those kind of discussions aren't particularly well known. And I think it's important that they're looked at quite carefully because there are human rights implications to these technical standards. Um, technology itself, as we know, is neutral, but the standards behind them preempt human rights to some extent. Once you configure an internet to provide much more state control, uh, then you essentially lose the ability to, to put forward or um, bake in human rights. Um, and um, it's very difficult to row back from that. So I think one way in which this cyber sovereignty, sovereignty and control model is playing out in the international debates is in these um, sort of technical standards discussions. I think another factor that um, is important to bear in mind is the digital Silk Road, which as you'll know, is a part of China's Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and it's an increasingly important part of China's foreign policy. In fact, uh, Xi Jinping in November made a speech in which he, he clarified that he would like to deepen cooperation with ASEAN countries on the digital Silk Road. And we're already seeing a number of digital Silk Road projects uh, in Asia, for example, the laying of fiber optic cables in Nepal and Myanmar. But the shape of the digital Silk Road is changing uh, away from a focus on just purely fiber optic cables 
towards the installation of AI, the establishment of smart cities and cyber centers um, and surveillance. And it's also gathering pace. We're starting to see much more investment um, in the digital Silk Road uh, from Chinese government and Chinese companies. Um, and it's expanding well beyond Asia. It's very prominent. There are many projects going on in Africa uh, and also in the Middle East. Um, and a cyber sovereignty model is associated with that digital Silk Road, because if we think about the technology that's being exported, um, often the establishment of a smart city with extensive uh, state surveillance capabilities has its own, um, its own ideology behind it, as it were, or the establishment of a, of a national cybersecurity center that enables a state to track and monitor um, communications, um, data and networks um, by its citizens. Um, so I think that's an important um, something to be, to be watching. Um, and, and it's not just, uh, again, ideology neutral as it were. But I would say that we need to see this in a more nuanced way. And there are some counterpoints that I would make. The digital Silk Road is not some coherent top-down vision. Um, it's, it's actually in reality, a number of projects which have government associations, but Chinese companies are involved as are the host governments, as are of course are the, are the users. So it's actually probably more complicated and messy uh, than, than simply an initiative that um, is overarching. On the other hand, the Belt and Road Initiative um, in general is, um, is consolidating and becoming more centralized. Um, and the digital Silk Road being, being relatively cheap is actually something that I think we're gonna see much more of as part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, I think it's also fair to say that one of the influences behind this uh, sort of lurch towards digital authoritarianism is a lack of regulation um, of, uh, of, online, of the online world. And, and we've seen that social media platforms have become a conduit for hate speech and, and disinformation and really problematic content, including incitement to violence in Myanmar uh, as a result of a lack of regulation by by the West, by, for example, the US, where many of the Silicon Valley social media companies um, are headquartered. And now I think a number of Western countries and the EU are catching up with that and seeking to regulate in a more balanced way. But in the meantime, this vacuum has been filled with regulation which goes too far um, and is really restrictive um, and chilling of freedom of expression in many countries in Asia. Um, and I suppose, Another factor that we should also think about when we're talking about, for example, Chinese influence on surveillance technology is that Western com companies themselves have, have been exporting uh, surveillance technology into Asia and elsewhere. Um, so it's not just China that's in play here. I would say that the EU has relatively recently agreed uh, some rules on the export of dual use technology like facial recognition technology, which seeks to prohibit the export where there are risks to human rights. So there are some attempts to address that. Uh, but it's also been said that the German Netz DG law, which, um, which is essentially a law that tries to it imposes obligations on big social media companies to take down harmful content such as hate speech that's illegal under German law. It's been cited as, as, a, as a source of inspiration for 13 countries around the world with authoritarian laws, um, essentially copycat laws that seek to um, force companies to take down online content. Now, in fact, those laws are much more oppressive than the German law, but it just goes to show that Western countries and legislation have also been an influence in this debate as well. Um, I think the final point I'd make is, is about COVID. We've seen that this authoritarianism in the digital space has really increased in COVID. And in some sense, it makes sense because states really want to control their populations and what they're doing. And of course, there are some valid health reasons for that, but too often it's been used as a pretext for greater government control. And um, if we think about China, China is actually, as Yachu has said, has, has done really quite well in containing the virus, but it's done so with technological tools like security cameras and facial recognition tools uh, and, uh, and an app, a super app that gives you a risk rating, uh, which are increasingly attractive to countries abroad um, and have really increased, apologies, have really increased um, an appetite for Chinese technological products, which, uh, if, if used purely for, for health reasons and for monitoring the quarantines, et cetera, may be okay, but they don't have these human rights safeguards baked into them. 
So I think in conclusion, um, there are many diverse influences in play and um, it's, it's, a, it's a very nuanced picture, but China is undoubtedly an influence. Um, there are some um, alternative visions out there beyond the cyber sovereignty model and I'm happy to uh, come on and talk about those um, if that would be interesting later on in, in the discussion. Thank you, Harriet. Just on that final point about alternative visions and to bring in one of the questions that we've had from our audience, you know, Prime Minister Martyr of Malaysia often talks about the Asian model. And there is this argument sometimes made that pushes back against those who say you need to protect freedom of expression, that it's a Western invention, you know, it's a Western concept. What would you say to those who take that line on why this is so important to ensure that we preserve this freedom uh, Yatu, maybe I come to you first. Oh, you're mute. Still on mute. Sorry. Uh, well, why it's so important to, uh, you know, preserve the freedom. Um, I talk to like Chinese friends and people online all the time. I mean, I feel, you know, WeChat is very useful in terms of efficiency and you know, deal with your life. Uh, um, I think more so than, you know, the apps uh, in the United States because it's just one thing you can do everything. Um, I mean, people, I think, first of all, the f I think freedom of speech is innate. So even with all this, my friends are mostly middle-class people. They live a good life in big cities. But I think because freedom of speech is innate, you wanted to express yourself, your opinions and feelings, and people feel very repressed. So um, I think it's just like, it's, it's a human nature you want to express. Uh, that is, I think it's beyond, you know, the practical concerns. But of course, practical concerns is that, you know, by expressing people's opinion, the government can uh, have better policies in terms of, uh, you know, how to govern the country. Um, so those are, you know, the practical good things coming out of, uh, you know, freedom of expression. Of course, I mean, Harry, you know, is an expert on international law, a freedom of expression is a right. So <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, you can, uh, it's harder to see on surface, you know, Chinese people express they want freedom of speech because that can have repercussions. But by, if you talk to people on a regular basis, I think that's a desire uh, 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 people that want, people want. Yeah, it's not seen as a Western imposition. Harriet, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I suppose that, you know, there's this, there is this tension between um, a model that's repressive and an open model. And I think when we're thinking about the sort of open global interconnected model, it shouldn't really be seen as a, as a Western model or an Asian model, because those are just labels that are sort of, I think, oversimplify. I think we all want, or we should all want um, interconnectivity because it's just, just very pragmatically, it's good for business. I mean, if you have an internet shutdown, then you basically don't have e-commerce. And I think, the way to sort of sometimes position this debate um, is obviously human rights is fundamental and that's most important in my mind, but there's also a very pragmatic thinking through of what it means to have fragmented internets, which have a national spaces only rather than the current interconnected open world that we have at the moment. Um, there are real economic benefits um, from an open internet. And if we're thinking about realization of the sustainable development goals, we're thinking about climate change and all the trans transnational issues that we're dealing with. They require the open global internet that we currently have rather than a fragmented uh, internet or splinter net as it's sometimes called. I think however, that we have to be realistic about what we mean by that. And really it has been very difficult to come up with an alternative model of regulation that balances the online harms that we see against freedom of expression. And it's not a surprise that it's taken governments quite a long time to work out what the way forward is on that and if there is a way forward. But I think on the positive side, we're seeing over the last few months even, a lot of proposals coming out from the EU, the UK, Australia, Ireland, um, for laws that seek to promote a balance by essentially, instead of focusing on the online content itself and telling companies to, what they can keep up or take down, actually looking at the whole systems behind those companies and their policies and um, putting out essentially in the UK's case, a duty of care that those companies have to think about online harms. 
and also codes of conduct that can be quite agile and adapted, uh, which essentially um, the regulator monitors the, the procedures of these companies. And that's much more of a proportionate risk-based approach to regulation than we're seeing in many of these more liberal regimes. Now it's not perfect and it's still being honed, but I think it offers the potential for an alternative vision. Thank you, Harriet. Yet to a question specifically for you here that we've had from our audience. Uh, the audience member seems, uh, writes, you suggested that many young people approve of the Great Firewall, but he wonders if the popularity of the Clubhouse app in China uh, points to something else. You know, many Chinese jumped at the opportunity to join a space that allowed for open discussion on more controversial topics. Do you, think, do you think this is an indication that the youth in the country are wanting to question official narratives and looking for those spaces where they can more freely discuss political issues? Um, first of all, I want to make the point that I don't actually know the public opinion in China, just given the political context of how suppressed. So I see all contradictory indicators and there's no good public, public opinion polls because yeah, well, it, you, it's, people wouldn't really tell, and it's hard to conduct those, those polls. Um, the reason I mentioned that uh, people, a lot of young people like the Great Firewall was because this is a so counterintuitive. Like who likes this firewall if you live in a free country, right? But I, I think I, I was trying to make the point that, uh, you know, how, you see how successful it is that people actually believe something that normal people living in a free country wouldn't want, right? But I don't know to what extent people actually, uh, the percentage of people who are, you know, like those kind of censorship and to what extent they genuinely believe it or they're just saying it uh, because they want to, you know, uh, for, for different, uh, for other reasons. Um, talking about the Clubhouse app, I don't, I, I don't know to what extent that is actually uh, indicator of the uh, you know, people uh, to what uh, people wanted to have alternative view uh, to express their alternative views or wanted to hear alternative views. Um, those people always exist. Random people email me saying, "Oh, I'm reading your stuff. A great work." I have no idea who those people are, and they're anonymous. They be, they wouldn't tell me who they are because of the political risks. So those people always exist. So and also Clubhouse and it is an um, iPhone app uh, app. So iPhone is an expensive phone in China. So there are certain people use it. And you know, you have to be invited to join Clubhouse. So it, uh, that all indicated that you only have a very small portion of people who are, um, are using that and who uh, are, you know, try to express or hear different views. Um, I don't think the what this app says is that, uh, that there are alternative views, there are desires for alternative views. To what extent that representative of the larger population? I have no idea. Thank you. Harriet, moving slightly more to sort of regional international responses, well, uh, we've had a question come in. What impact do you think groups like the Global Network Initiative um, have or to impact or influence in an effective way to develop regulations? Uh, many big tech companies are starting up their own initiatives, but obviously they've got a different agenda. And that links to another question from our audience about the power of international internet providers such as Microsoft and Facebook relative to the individual states in which they're trying to operate. Great questions, thank you. Um, so the Global Network Initiative, uh, obviously a collection of, uh, of tech companies, which are essentially working together to try and uphold human rights standards, I think is an excellent body and it's an excellent idea, which has a lot of power behind it because in these um, debates, there needs to be action in coalition. I think when governments or individual companies try to take a stand um, against um, authoritarian regimes on these issues, it's very difficult. Um, but if, um, if there is action in coalition, then there can be a really uh, powerful uh, stance and debate. And one example actually is the Asia Internet Coalition, uh, which, which was um, uh, the body through which Facebook, Twitter, and Google stood up to the Pakistan government, which had come out with some quite draconian draft laws on regulation of social media. Uh, and these companies were working together with civil society and they objected to, uh, to these laws and then the government pulled them. But unfortunately they were then um, actually brought into force in November, but 
Now there is some kind of court action. So we're starting to see a real sort of tension and dialogue there because these companies are acting in coalition. Um, and I think your second question, which is about, I suppose, the power of tech companies. I think we're seeing a lot of very interesting tensions playing out in liberal regimes, which are introducing a lot of these quite draconian laws, um, kind of locking horns with very powerful tech companies like Facebook and Twitter, for many of whom in those countries, Facebook is the internet. So quite a different scenario to China, which has its own you know, very powerful social media companies like WeChat that are uh, you know, obviously affiliated in some way with the government or you know, work with the government on, um, on, on the online space. Um, in countries, for example, like Myanmar, where Facebook you know, is a very important way of accessing the internet, we're seeing Facebook and Twitter in India recently pushing back against some of these, um, these proposals. Um, in Thailand, we've seen the government trying to force Facebook to take down material that's critical of the royal family and Facebook trying to push back. There's been a threatening of legal action by the government. Um, and in some cases, the government has essentially had the upper hand and we might look at India where uh, Twitter was pushing back and saying, we're not going to block these accounts because of freedom of expression. Um, and then the Indian government, um, partly in response to that has fast tracked some quite stringent social media regulations. Um, but in other countries, and I think Pakistan is one of them, there's much more of a debate going on because these companies are acting in coalition. So while we might see the power of these companies as in some way um, not necessarily a good thing and needing to be regulated um, in a balanced way where possible, in some ways, um, if these companies are signing up to a rights-based approach, and I think increasingly we are seeing um, rights-based policies coming out of Microsoft, Facebook, Twitter, partly because of um, civil society and the Global Network Initiative really trying to sort of show a vision of what, what rights-based internet governance looks like, then they companies um, can be quite good ambassadors for this much more open and global approach. Thank you, Harriet. Uh, turn to you now, Yachul. Sometimes people, I think there's a risk when we talk about China that people talk about in a very homogenizing, monolithic way with the Chinese Communist Party at the heart of every single decision that's made. But as one of our questions, uh, audience members is, uh, has a question for you is, what about the rivalry between central authorities and local authorities when it comes to the use of arrests to silence citizen journalists? Do, do you see this play, do you see some of the tensions around regulating online expression playing out between the central and provincial levels? Or do you think there's a more sort of uniform approach to how this issue is uh, pursued within the Chinese kind of political ecosystem? Well, I think the central government does have overwhelming power in dicta uh, dictating how the internet is censored or who to get uh, arrested. Uh, but as I mentioned it very earlier that, you know, there was an outpouring of outrage on the internet at the very beginning of the pandemic. Uh, that was very unusual. If you follow the Chinese internet. I think that was how the, the center wants to see what's going on around the country, how people feel. They don't necessarily trust what the local government in Wuhan was reporting to them. So you can see kind of suspicion between the center and the local. And in terms of uh, the attention of, um, uh, of political activists or you know journalists, I think there is definitely, in, I, the general model, model is that the center that Beijing wants people, you know, people to uh, be silenced. So the local governments, police de uh, departments, are the ones who carry out the, those investigation, those arrests. I think oftentimes the local governments wants people uh, want to show to the center, you know, we're doing a great job of detaining detaining all these people, following our order. So they are, uh, and so because those, those kind of, you know, showing to the center, I'm doing all these arrests and investigation was trying to get themselves promoted in the system. But sometimes it's not a, a necessarily a, a, a positive or effective thing. For example, because it could generate like Western media attention. So people know, you know, this is so repressive. So that's not necessarily the, the cent what the Beijing, the central government want. Uh, so I think they, you, you can see a kind of a tension own that regard. Uh, yeah, so I think it's more complicated than just, you know, Beijing dictates everybody uh, in terms of how they censor or how they arrest people. 
Thank you, yeah, chill. And Harriet Chinch, now for our final question, because unfortunately we are coming to the end of our time. But what do you see as some of the implications of China's increase in influence in setting standards on free speech and open uh, internet? As you were saying, you know, within certain UN bodies, you're seeing increased kind of presence of China. They're engaging more in the debates around setting the tech standards. So what do you think are some of the implications of greater Chinese influence? But also, where do we go from here? I mean, what are the counterbalances to the, this digital authoritarianism? And how do we develop and foster these alternative visions uh, for those who want to see an open global internet? Thank you, Chopra. I think on the technical standards point, I suppose the main thing that I need, I think we need to think that these are not just technical standards debates. They're not, it's not just a technical discussion. It has real political implications and human rights implications. And I think until recently, there hasn't been necessarily a thorough understanding of that beyond the technical community, because sometimes there wasn't even a knowledge that this kind of debate was going on. And so there's, um, I think there's a need for there to be more diplomats in these discussions so that there's a better understanding of what's actually being discussed. Um, it's something that Chatham House are doing more work on as well to unpack the human rights implications of essentially rewiring the architecture of the internet so that we end up with potentially more fragmented, fragmented internet. Um, and I think in terms of where we go from here, there needs to be, I would say, more transatlantic dialogue on what kind of internet governance we want, what kind of internet we want, and really understanding what uh, I suppose a, a siloed internet actually means, as I say, not just for human rights, but also for sort of the economy and for engagement on international, on a range of international issues and trade and investment. Um, I do also think though that when we're looking at these issues, we need to think about, um, we need to get to know China better. We need to understand China. It's very easy to talk about China from the outside. And so people who are uh, working in the technical standards bodies or working on technical technological governance, um, the people who have actually lived in China and worked in China understand China, a much better place to actually um, understand the position because as Yashu said, it's actually quite complicated and it's very easy to badge countries or box countries. Um, and so finally, I'd say on the alternative visions, I've mentioned regulation and the fact that we are starting to see some balanced models of regulation come out. Obviously, with the new Biden administration, there's a real momentum around discussions on, on how to regulate the Internet. And the US is looking at that as part of its policy agenda. But we all have to bear in mind as well that China's aim is to be a technological superpower. And it really is already excelling in um, its development of technology. So I think it's also important that we come up with alternatives uh, in, in the technology sphere as well to 5G and, um, and other products so that um, consumers have choice and countries have choice. And those countries that are as yet undecided about what kind of internet model they want can really understand the implications of those models and also have, have a choice as, as to what kind of technology and technological standards they go for. Thank you, Harris. And as you say, quite a complex picture because you know, it's a transatlantic approach to what an open internet should look like. I mean, it's also got to be inclusive of the global south, right? So it needs to bring in the other sort of big major middle powers, whether that's Brazil, Nigeria, India, Japan, it needs to be a kind of much broader conversation than it is now where people get sort of stuck between the tent poles of the US and China. And, you know, there's sometimes only broad characterization of competing visions. Absolutely, it is much more messy than that. And I think, you know, we focused a lot in this webinar on civil and political rights, which Western democracies tend to focus on. But of course, economic and social rights are, are equally important. And these are universal, indivisible rights. Um, so I think it's really important, especially in engaging countries in the global south. And as I say, these many small and middle sized countries that haven't really kind of they're surveying the internet landscape and haven't necessarily decided what kind of model they're, they're going to go for, um, that they that they sort of think about the implications of, a, of an open global internet for economic and social rights as well. And there is a role there for capacity building because technology is evolving so fast and the human rights implications of those we are starting to get a handle on, but um, we definitely need more capacity building in, in countries where there may not be such um, institutional knowledge about these issues. Absolutely. Well, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time. Thank you to all our audience members. And I'm 
My apologies to all of you whose questions I wasn't able to bring in. Uh, but as you can see, you know, in this short space of time, it's very hard to do justice to the complexity of the issues. But I hope we've been able to help you think through some of the implications, whether it's within China or more broadly at the regional level or international level. And I'm sure this is a conversation we will continue to have. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, there's a short questionnaire. It would be great if you are able to complete that at the end of this webinar, but we hope to see you all soon. Many thanks. Goodbye for now.